You must ask one special favor of those who watch this program. Our traditional coyote stories should only be told or discussed during winter when snow is on the ground. The elders usually bring out the stories in November and put them away again when the snow is gone, usually by late February or March. Coyote stories, like other parts of our traditional way of life, are part of a seasonal cycle. By following this tradition, viewers can enjoy this aspect of our culture, keeping and saving something for the time of the year in which it belongs. Western scientific and indigenous approaches to understanding Earth are often similar but also different in several fundamental ways. Geologists attempt to explain, describe, and classify materials and processes, and they think of time as a linear sequence progressing from beginning to end. Traditional people often view and interact with landscapes in a different way. Traditional native perspectives and oral traditions document the close connections between people and landscapes, mountains, rivers, lakes, and other features. The native view is holistic and encompasses landscapes, animals, plants, and people, all of which are alive and deserving of respect. Processes happen in cycles rather than in a linear sequence of time. Tribal elders pass on knowledge through stories and oral history. The Salish, Kootenai, and Ponderay people often present the cultural perspective of the landscape on the Flathead Reservation through the telling of coyote stories. These stories portray complex and respectful worldviews in which animals lived on Earth prior to humans and made the world better for the eventual arrival of the human species. Because coyote made all of the landforms, local landscapes are culturally important to the Salish, Kootenai, and Ponderay people. Coyote stories are an important part of traditional teaching, but local cultural protocol reserves these stories for telling during the winter months. Teachers are asked to respect this tradition. One of the collaborative FGEP activities was a series of field trips with high school students, teachers, tribal elders, and SKC faculty. This program includes footage of these field trips, which we hope will serve as a valuable resource for teaching earth science in area schools. Both the traditional and scientific viewpoints recognize the unique topography of the Flathead Reservation. Salish, Ponderay, and Kootenai people explain the landforms through oral traditions involving a number of characters, including coyote, hawk, grouse, and a monster in Flathead Lake. Geologists talk about glaciers, glacial lakes, and moraines. We're here at the Big Draw, so we're in between Elmo and Nyarada. And, um, the reason we stopped here is so we could explain a few glacial features and talk about the landscape in general. If you look to the northeast toward Chief Cliff, uh, you can see a pretty constricted valley. And then if you look over this way toward Nyarada, you can see that the valley continues, but it, it broadens out and it looks somewhat like a river valley, except it's totally dry. And there's a reason for that. I can take us back now to the glacial periods, uh, 10,000 or more years ago, when there were huge sheets of ice coming down from Canada due to a different climate than we have today. And those ice sheets built up to thousands of feet thick and they made their way southward toward the Flathead Reservation and for a lot of that time the uh, what's now the Polson or the sorry the what's now the Flathead Lake Basin was filled with uh, a lot of ice and one of the lobes of that ice mass 
followed a topographic low and it came over into what's now the Elmo area and ended up, some of the ice ended up butting up against uh, bedrock and that bedrock is what we call Chief Cliff now. And uh, geologists think the reason that that cliff is so sheer and vertical is because that cliff was one side of a, a glacial meltwater channel. So you can imagine Chief Cliff here and a mass of ice about the same height or, or even higher perhaps here. Uh, as the glacier was retreating, it produced a lot of meltwater. And so one place that some of that meltwater could go was out laterally along the side of the glacier, uh, but there was bedrock on the other side to constrict its flow. So you have a really fast flowing cold water with a lot of sediment in it that came out on the side of Chief Cliff and began to erode it out. And uh, I believe that Maybe the, uh, Vernon Finley and the some others were right on by. in uh, Stink so, Lake um, area recently, which is also called Black Lake. And there's so another lake there did. called Red they Lake. And uh, those lakes fill depressions that were created by this tremendous force of water coming around the east side of Chief Cliff. Um, and then in the beginning of this, I pointed out the long river channel like valley that we have right here in the big draw. And it's believed that that's where a lot of this glacial meltwater flowed out uh, once it came out of Chief Cliff, out of the Chief Cliff area. So if you look to the west here, to the southwest, you can see kind of an undulating landscape. And actually right here below me is what looks like a, an abandoned river channel. And uh, there's a lot of, of these channels in the big draw. And if you look at an aerial photo from above, you can see very distinctly some distributed river channels, but they've been dry for probably more than 10,000 years. And I believe the <coughs> highway department has even built culverts on Highway 28 over some of these channels, even though there's no evidence of, of any flow in them since the, the Ice Age. So that's pretty interesting. Um, I guess I can talk now about the, the Elmo Moraine, which is a, a pretty large feature to the east of us here. And um, the ice lobe that I was talking about earlier that came off of the main ice mass that was in uh, the Flathead Lake area, it bulldozed all this material up into a big pile. And that's what we see here to the, to the east. And it's made out of a complete, completely mixed up jumble of gravel, boulders, silt, sand, and gravel. And so that explains why we have a, a big hill there. Uh, geologists think that prior to the Ice Age, or the most recent Ice Age anyway, the outlet of Flathead Lake was here through the big draw. And now we can see that there's a giant jumble of boulders and sand and gravel called the Elmo Moraine. And we think that the Elmo Moraine blocked the flow of the ancestral Flathead River out through the big draw. And because of that, the uh, outlet of Flathead Lake is now at Polson. Point out too that at least one tribal story of, of kind of unknown origin at this point describes, uh, at least in my mind, describes the Elmo Moraine and the Polson Moraine and explains the changing outlet of Flathead Lake. So. That's a pretty good example of how we have a connection between geology and, and culture. And I know that that's, in the course of this project, that's kind of been a controversial story, but I did just pick up a, a copy of a publication from the SKC bookstore, which talks about uh, the natural resources and the uh, cultural resources of the reservation and, and that story is 
is uh, in that publication. If you kind of look out under the distance, you see the, two, the kind of two hillsides um, um, just on, to the north and then to the south where um, all those cows are. I guess to me what I imagine is just that those two hillsides at one point, if you could kind of imagine those points meeting, that was probably about maybe the original elevation of the, the, the valley. So there's probably several hundred, um, four to five hundred feet of, of sediment deposits from, from the glacial outwash filling up the big draw and creating this very um, more just flat, even surface. That's a good point, and I think <clears throat> that the similar situation has happened <clears throat> between in between the Polson Moraine and Post Creek. You got two moraines there, one at, at Polson, and then you've got a, just a giant amount of glacial outwash, sediment, dune sand that's been deposited in between there and the moraine that is just north of Post Creek. So that that would probably be a depression if it weren't for all the glacial outwash that's come in and, and been deposited in that area. Now, these boulders are pretty angular, at least the ones that are right here around us. So that suggests that they were probably not transported very far from their place of origin. So I would guess that these might have been transported by glacial meltwater that came through here, but maybe they were only broken off, you know, as far away as the Chief Cliff area. The melt water um, from the glacier was uh, subaqueous or was being, it was essentially melting into glacial Lake Missoula. Um, and that um, then after glacial Lake Missoula drained for the, la for the final time, um, you then had the beginning of the formation of these, uh, of the um, glacial outwash river channels. Right now we're at, on Highway 28, about two or three miles west of Elmo, and we're standing at a road cut that cuts right through the Elmo moraine. And so if you look behind me, you can see a whole bunch of jumbled material ranging from silt and clay-sized particles to uh, boulders and cobbles. And then I guess I'll let Steve, I'll let you talk about that channel, but uh, we're. The point of this stop is to get some footage of get some footage of glacial till forming the Elmo moraine, um, and then the large particles are mostly rocks from the Belt Supergroup that most likely were transported here by glaciers uh, from the north, maybe from Canada or from from the Flathead Valley area. If you look directly across the road, you can see a lighter colored sediment. Um, and that's kind of a U-shaped formation that is um, suggestive of a, a river channel. Um, so the suggestion here is that this was a glacial outwash channel that then at some later point filled in with Glacial Lake Missoula sediment. So that lighter colored um, sediment is the kind of lacustrine silt that's typical of the, the lake bed sediments um, that, that fell to the bottom of Glacial Lake Missoula. We're at the top of the Elmo Moraine, um, the terminal point of the Elmo lobe of the Cordillera Ice Sheet, and this is just a great place to look at glacial till. Um, then you have the glacier, glacier essentially acting as a bulldozer and then coming to its terminal point and then depositing all of this sediment in, in it does it in a way that um, sediment is unsorted. So you have all different sizes of, of sediment. Um, you can see the larger sized cobbles and boulders. Um, and then mixed in with that is the smaller, um, smaller sized sediments, silts, clays, and sands. Um, so just a great, great place to look at, at glacial till and easy to pull over with a class and, and, and take a quick look. Yeah, at the big draw, there was a coyote was making a, I guess, a river for the salmon to come through. Mm -hmm. We went over there by uh, Narada, and we found some uh, 
camas. Dug some camas and he started baking it, you know, while he was digging that ditch there. And he, a bunch of women come through there and he had a, went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so so he, that's why he didn't finish his ditch. <laughs> <laughs> Fell in love. <laughs> yeah, I mean, today you can go there by Narada, you can see his bacon pit there, that mound. Yeah, that's a land farm we've got a story on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he gets in trouble once in a while over women. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like I say, he was pretty mischievous and pretty smart yeah, at times. Even today, you know, <laughs> our young kids there started flirting with. Girls would call him Sinchilet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you Sinchilet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he didn't even finish his bacon either. He took <laughs> off. <laughs> didn't even finish his job. <laughs> but they got a name for that area a lot. I don't know why they call it. They went in. Went in a, in the place, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, Courtney, I guess they got a different story for that. And one of the people heard Toad turn back around, you know, and she was she was working on a hide. She was scraping a hide when they came up, and she was working on that. And when she turned back around to start paying attention to her hide again, she turns around and says, kind of mumbles, you know, why should I help you? Why should I help you? You're trying to kill my brother. And so the, somebody heard, heard her say that and went and told Hawk, you know, hey, you know, she said that, uh, you know, tell him what she said. She said that the monster was her brother and that we was trying to kill him, so she wasn't going to help us. And Toad reached in her back, you know, and she reached in her back and pulled out some water. And, sprinkled it on the hide and was using it on the hide as she was working it. And so they said, you know, and she's got water too. So he turned around, Hawk turned around, went back and shot Toad and killed her. Then they, then they took her water, they all got a drink, and then they continued on looking for the monster. And at the end of Big Drop here, there's a hill up on the right, after you get up towards Nairata and you look up towards the right, there's a big hill there. It's th today we call it Sullivan Hill. Um, but the, um, the name of that place is Akuk Yusak Es Yawunik. And that's, that, that's where, that's where Hawk caught up to, caught up to the monster. That's where, that's where he's laying and he's all full of water. But he still had the arrow sticking out of him. So Hawk goes up there and grabs the arrow and pulls the arrow out. All the water starts to gush out, you know, like taking your finger out of the dam or something, you know. <laughs> all the water starts to pour out and starts to pour out all over and everybody's, all right, you know, water. And the water starts filling up, fills up everywhere, only it keeps on going. Keeps filling up and keeps filling up. Now we got a flood on our hands. So all the, all the people ran further that way and they was trying to get away from it. And on the, in back of Hot Springs, if you look up there, there's a, a mountain there they call um, Baldy. That's where they were going. They was going up that mountain. They kept going up and going up and the water kept rising and kept rising and kept rising. And he kept going on up the mountain and, and they was, you know, saying, you know, what are we going to do? You know, we're going to all drown. So they told Hawk, you know, blaming Hawk again and told him, you know, hey, you know, you've got to do something about this. So he took one of his tail feathers and, you know, the Hawk's tail feathers has them stripes on them. He took one of his tail feathers and he stuck it in the ground up there on the mountain and he said, all right, I'll, I'll sing. I'll sing my songs and I'll try to get the water to stop. But if the water rises past that third stripe, then he beat me. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna all, we're gonna all die. And so he starts singing his song, trying to stop the water. And the water keeps going, keeps rising. 
and they say it's passing the first stripe and it keeps going and it's passing the second stripe and it, the water keeps rising and gets up and he says it's getting to the third stripe and it gets to the third stripe and he's singing and he's singing his hardest and trying his hardest and it stopped it stops right on the third stripe and he keeps singing and singing and the water finally starts to go back down and everybody's it's going down it's going down and he kept singing as the water went down and went down and went down to where it, to where the level is now that's when he stopped singing and he said all right now we have enough water you know not too much not too little we have enough water now and that's the way you know that's the way we'll leave it and so everybody can go back home so then everybody went back home now what I, where I was talking to you about, about uh, Sullivan Hill, that's, that's Yahoo, or the, the, the monster, that's his body. That's, that, that's where he's at. That's where, that's where uh, they caught up to him, and that's where uh, uh, caught up to him and, and released all the water from him. So uh, that's where that is. And so that's, that's how, pretty much how the big draw was formed, and where, where the monster is, and then later on they came up with uh, ideas about and and you'll notice that when whenever something happens whenever there's anything that's going on you and your friends can be watching something as it happens and then you'll notice later on when you come back and you start somebody asks you about it and you you talk about it you were both there but the but the stories you tell about the event are different you know well that's kind of the way that it works with these stories and with what you hear about you know uh, glacial lake missoula and you know glaciers and the way things are formed and the way the scientific theories are and everything it's an explanation of the same event and the same thing. It was just looking at it with different eyes. It's the, the same thing happened, but it's just looking at it with different eyes that comes up with a different story. So, so one of the things that in all of this stuff that will help you the most in science classes and in everything is to know your traditional stories about it and then when you look at when you hear it from the scientific viewpoint from the scientific eye you'll you can kind of see you can see some different uh, you'll you'll see explanations of the same thing but if you understand both that'll put you ahead of the ones who only see it with the scientific eye and you'll it'll put you ahead of the ones that only see it from a traditional Indian eye, you know, you'll see it from both, and that's that's what'll help you the most. So it's really good to you know to listen to all of the scientific explanations, and you hear the stories about it, and it'll help you to to make some to draw some larger conclusions, some some bigger views about the whole thing. We're here to give one perspective of the landscape and how it came to be, and. It's a story, so just like any story, it's kind of open to interpretation.